and today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite instruments, the theremin. Let's get started. Tanner, tech, tanner, tech, tanner, tanner, tech, tanner, tech, tanner. Hello, this is tanner tech. A theremin is a very unique instrument, especially in how you play it. It is one of the only instruments that you play without physically touching it. It makes use of two radio antennas and a lot of interesting circuitry to make this function. The first antenna is the pitch antenna that changes the frequency of the music as you bring your hand nearer and farther from it. The second antenna is called the volume antenna, and as you may have guessed, it changes the volume of the music according to your hand's proximity to it. By changing the proximity of your left and right hand to both volume and pitch antennas, you can create some really cool music. As many of you may or may not know, I spent a lot of time last year building my own theremin. It was a beautiful instrument built out of parts from the 1950s, but alas it was a bit too heavy to take on the plane to Boston. So now enter Open Theremin. It is something that I came across on the internet and it really struck me as kind of cool because of one feature. The fact that it's actually an Arduino. Wow. This device is an Arduino shield that turns any Arduino Uno into a fully functional theremin that actually sounds very good. Now, one thing that I really like about this is that it's completely open source. The schematics, the board files, the code, everything is available online. So you could easily go online, download the board files, get like 10 of these boards made on JLC PCB or something, order all the parts off DigiKey, and have a fully functional theremin built for very cheap. But I wanted to support the person who created this, so I bought one from his website. Let's now take a look at the circuit and figure out how this device works. Now before I show you the circuit, I must warn you, this looks pretty complicated. There you go. Maybe it was as complicated as you thought, maybe it wasn't. But to me, it looks pretty chaotic. One thing though that I found over my time of looking at circuits and analyzing them is that it really helps to break them down into small blocks and some components. Makes things easier. So I've done that here in drawing a block diagram. The open theremin works using four radio frequency oscillators, an Arduino, and a couple of other important parts. The first oscillator is connected to the antenna that you move your hand near, and it outputs a very high frequency square wave that changes frequencies depending on how close your hand is to the antenna. This oscillator also has an external input from this digital to analog converter and then the Arduino. This allows the Arduino to supply an analog voltage to this device to auto-tune it and change the frequency when you press the auto-tune button. The second oscillator also outputs a very high frequency square wave, but this one does not change. The outputs of both oscillators are fed into a frequency mixer, which does some cool math and subtracts the two frequencies from each other. So if this oscillator is putting out 440,000 hertz, and this oscillator is putting out 430,000 hertz, the output of this would be a square wave at a frequency of 10,000 hertz, which is a lot easier to work with for the Arduino. Because we have two of the exact same circuit, we end up with two inputs to the Arduino that consist of a relatively low frequency square wave that changes its frequency based off how close your hand is to each antenna. The Arduino then takes the data it receives from the mixers, as well as the data it receives from the controls, and sends an output signal to the digital to analog converter that converts the binary data from the Arduino into analog data that we can hear through a speaker. Going back to the schematic, you can see that I've highlighted all these subsections of the circuit that correspond to the different blocks that we were just looking at. Over here we have the first oscillator of the pitch section, the second oscillator of the pitch section, and the mixer. Down here we have the first oscillator of the volume section, second of the volume section, and the mixer of the volume section. This is the digital to analog converter that serves to auto-tune both the pitch section and the volume section. This is the audio output section that contains the digital to analog converter that generates the audio that you heard while listening to my theremin. Down here we have the control section where the user can enter inputs via these four potentiometers, and, of course, the most important part, the Arduino. This is the first oscillator in the pitch section, and it's very interesting. 
It utilizes something called a Coplitz oscillator to change frequency based off how close your hand is to the antenna. Let's take a look at what a Coplitz oscillator is. Here is a more simplified version of what we were just looking at. So here we have a NOT gate. And basically what this does is it outputs the opposite of what you give it in the input. So if you input 0 volts, it'll output the VCC voltage, or in this case, 5 volts. If you give it an input voltage of 5 volts, it'll output 0 volts. It'll change this output voltage once the input voltage has either risen above a certain threshold or fallen below a certain threshold. This is called the LC tank circuit, and arguably one of the most important parts of the theremin. It consists of a few capacitors and an inductor. What happens here, these capacitors are initially charged through some voltage source, the output of this NOT gate. That is then going to discharge this inductor, generating an electromagnetic field. That magnetic field is then going to collapse and keep a current flowing through this to charge the capacitors to the opposite polarity. That cycle is then going to reverse as the capacitors discharge through the inductor, the current keeps going, and then charges the capacitors back up again. The time that this takes to happen is dependent on the value of the inductor and the values of the capacitors. Because these capacitors are already very small, on the order of picofarads, the capacitance change that happens when you bring your hand near to the antenna will have a larger effect on the output frequency than if it was running at a lower frequency. The cell C tank circuit is great. Its oscillation frequency can be changed by how close your hand is to the antenna. But by itself, it can't really do much. Once you initially charge these capacitors, the cycle that I just discussed is going to happen a couple times and then die out due to the resistance in the inductor and in the capacitors. That is why we need the NOT gate here, to fulfill something called the Barkhausen Stability Criterion. The Barkhausen Criterion has two important points. First of all, the loop gain is equal to unity in absolute magnitude, and second of all, the phase shift around the loop is zero or an integer multiple of 2 pi. Let's see if this circuit checks off that first part of the criterion and has a loop gain of 1. So this component has a gain of greater than 1 because it's an amplifier. The voltage coming out is going to be greater than the voltage coming in. Because of how a CD4069 chip works, and this inverter will be able to switch an output of between 0 and 5 volts from an input of between 1 and 4 volts, which means that it is amplifying and has a gain of greater than 1. This LC circuit is going to have a gain of less than 1, but greater than 0, because the voltage coming into it is going to be greater than the voltage coming out. This is going to have a gain of less than 1, and this is going to have a gain of greater than 1, and multiplied together, that gain can be exactly 1 under some specific circumstances, those circumstances are when it's oscillating at the resonant frequency of this LC circuit. So first check, this passes the first part of the Barkhausen criterion. Now for the second part. Let's see if the phase shift around this loop is equal to either 0 or 2 pi radians. That is equal to 0 or 360 degrees. What is phase shift? Right here I have a sine wave drawn on an x-axis that is labeled in degrees and radians, going from 0 to 2 pi or 360 degrees for one full cycle of this sine wave. So let's say I superimpose another sine wave on top of it. When it's in the exact same place, the sine wave has been shifted from its original position by 0. So the phase shift here is 0. Now let's say I move it here. That sine wave has now been shifted by 90 degrees or pi over 2. If I move it over here, that sine wave has been phase shifted by pi or 180 degrees. If I move it all the way to 360 degrees, you can see that it matches up with itself again. In this circuit, because this NOT gate is an inverter, it has a phase shift of 180 degrees. The voltage coming in will be 180 degrees out of phase with the voltage coming out. Now to the capacitors. Capacitors inherently phase shift a signal by 90 degrees. So for instance, if the voltage here is 5 volts, the voltage here is going to be ground level, and the voltage here, due to the nature of this LC circuit, is going to be something below ground level. So we can see that this has phase shifted the voltage by 90 degrees and then 180 degrees. If we keep following this path along the loop, it's then going to go through the NOT gate, and then it's going to be phase shifted another 180 degrees, so we get this circuit having 
two 90 degree phase shifts and a 180 degree phase shift. In total, that is 360 degrees of phase shift or two pi radians or zero, which means that this circuit satisfies both points of the Barkhausen criteria. So there you go, here we have the inductor, the inverter, the resistors, and some of the capacitors. You can see how my circuit was a little bit easier to understand. Oh, here's something interesting. These are the varactor diodes that help tune the circuit. So varactor diodes are diodes that change their capacitance based off the reverse bias voltage applied to them, in this case by the digital to analog converter. These varactor diodes are placed in parallel with the other capacitors in the LC tank circuit. So by adjusting the voltage here, we can change the capacitance and therefore the resonant frequency of the circuit. This output then goes to the mixer. Let's talk about this next oscillator. This next part of the circuit is built on a CD4060 binary counter. This has inputs for a 8 MHz crystal, two capacitors, and resistors. With this hooked up, this will oscillate at 8 MHz and generate an 8 MHz square wave within this chip. On these outputs, we will have different frequencies that are this 8 MHz frequency divided by certain amounts. So let's say we have this 8 MHz frequency on Q4, that's going to divide it by 16, Q5 will be divided by 32, Q6 will be divided by 64, and so on till the bottom. That means that from this 8 MHz signal on Q4, because it's divided by 16, we will get 500 kilohertz, and on Q8, which we need for the sample clock, we'll get 31.25 kilohertz. The 31.25 kilohertz signal on Q14 is used by the Arduino as kind of an internal reference when it's analyzing the different signals that it's receiving from the mixers. Speaking of mixers, let's talk about those. How on earth does a chip take two frequencies and subtract them? The answer to that question comes from looking at the logic table for this chip. So we know that in our circumstance, set and reset are both going to be high all the time, so this is the only part of the logic table that we really care about in the moment. We also know that we will only care about what happens when the outputs change. So that leaves just these two lines as the most important. In the cases that we care about, the outputs will only change on the rising edge of the clock signal. So on the rising edge, if the data signal is high, then the output will be high. On the rising edge, if the data signal is low, then the output will be low. Here's an example to help understand how this chip is able to subtract the frequencies of two signals. Here we have the clock signal and the data signal. And the only part that we care about is what the data signal is at the time when the clock signal has its rising edge, which are all these red dots in the clock signal. So for this first one, the output signal is going to be high. It's going to stay high because on this rising edge, it's high. This rising edge, it's high. This rising edge, it's high. All the way till here when on this rising edge, the data signal is low. So we will draw a line going from here to this point where on the rising edge, the data signal starts to be low. That data signal is going to continue to be low on the rising edge until the very end. All right, now I'm gonna blow your minds here. This is one full cycle of a square wave. The clock signal goes through about 7.5 full cycles, within this period between the two orange lines, the data signal goes through about 7.0 full revolutions between these two orange lines. If we look at this red portion, that is about half a cycle. So the circuit actually will subtract frequencies. If we call this period between the two orange lines one second, then that would make this frequency at 7.5 hertz, this frequency at 7 hertz, and this frequency at 0.5 hertz. Computer logic is awesome. Well, there you have it. That's how the pitch and volume sections of the circuit work, and that is how the Arduino is able to know exactly how far your hand is from the pitch and volume antennas. As for the other parts of the circuit, they are relatively straightforward. Down here we just have some capacitors that make a filtering part of the power supply. Over here we have the input, which comes from just some potentiometers that feed into the Arduino. And the audio output stage is just a digital to analog converter going to an audio amplifier so it can drive some relatively low impedance loads. This is the program that runs on the Arduino, and I'm not even going to begin to explain it because I do not completely understand it yet. There are a lot of things in here that go over my head.
Needless to say, this program allows the Arduino to output one of eight predefined waveforms at varying volumes and frequencies based off inputs from the two mixers that come from the volume and pitch antenna oscillator circuits. It is also able to recalibrate itself at the press of a button using varactor diodes. When you see someone playing the theremin, it looks a lot like magic. But when it really comes down to it, it's just down-to-earth physics and electrical engineering. Have a good day.